July, August, and September 1966. These were some of the most eventful months to date in United States manned space flight. It was a period of extensive progress in flight operations, continued qualification of Apollo Saturn hardware, and intensified work toward program goals. Two manned missions, Gemini 10 and Gemini 11, were flown, and they met with a degree of success that underscored the operational maturity of the program. Gemini 10 was manned by John Young, command pilot, and Michael Collins, pilot. And there were a host of major achievements and relatively only minor problems. An Agena target vehicle and the Gemini 10 spacecraft were launched almost precisely into planned orbits. A rendezvous was achieved in the fourth orbit, facilitated by the launch of the Gemini space vehicle at precisely the beginning of the 35-second launch window. After station keeping, Gemini 10 closed and docked with a target vehicle, the second time this has been accomplished in manned space flight. Perfecting the ability to rendezvous and dock is of particular significance since it is basic to Apollo and other operations in space. Following checkouts, the target vehicle propulsion system was ignited, a maneuver the first of its kind. Part of the burn was photographed by the crew. Gemini 10 was propelled to a record altitude of some 475 statute miles thus demonstrating an ability to acquire and use a supplementary propulsion source parked in space. This too is basic to many upcoming operations. Other mission highlights, unfortunately not recorded on film, included two additional burns for the Agena propulsion system, three extravehicular exercises by pilot Collins, rendezvous with an Agena from an earlier mission, the recovery of a micrometeorite collection device from that Agena, and experiments for several sciences. There were two problems of note. Spacecraft fuel was used in excess during the first rendezvous maneuver and had to be carefully managed throughout the remainder of the flight. And in the first extravehicular activity, pilot Collins experienced difficulties which forced a premature end to the exercise. Otherwise, at the end of three days, virtually all mission objectives had been met, and the crew initiated retrofire and began the return to Earth. During descent through the atmosphere, the ionized wake of air surrounding the spacecraft was photographed by the crew. The mission ended in the planned recovery area in the Atlantic Ocean. The Gemini 11 flight crew was Charles Conrad, command pilot, and Richard Gordon, pilot. As planned, Gemini 11 lifted off at the beginning of a two-second launch window and met with its Agena target vehicle during the spacecraft's initial revolution. Another first for manned space flight, the maneuver provided a measure of the crew workload and procedures for the Apollo rendezvous maneuver required in the event of an abort of a lunar module descent to the moon. During the next several revolutions, each crew member docked twice with the Agena, remaining attached after the final docking maneuver. The following day, pilot Gordon conducted the first extravehicular exercise. As in an earlier Gemini flight, extravehicular work proved exceedingly strenuous and the pilot was able to complete only a portion of the assigned tasks. He was, however, able to connect a 100-foot-long tether for use in an experiment the following day. The difficulties in extravehicular work will be investigated closely in the following months. Twice more during the mission, the pilot's hatch was opened, once to dispose of equipment no longer needed, wants to photograph Earth features and star fields of scientific interest. Command pilot Conrad ignited the Agena propulsion system at the beginning of the 26th revolution 
inserting the Gemini 11 Agena space vehicle into a new higher orbit. The spacecraft's altitude at the apogee, or high point, was 851 statute miles, and its velocity at the perigee, or low point, was 17,943 miles per hour. Both the altitude and velocity were new records. After two orbits, the crew used the Agena propulsion system to return to a lower orbit. The crew undocked, but remained attached to the Agena by the tether connected previously by Pilot Gordon. The crew began a slow spin of the tethered assemblage, finally succeeding in attaining a stable condition. This was a first step toward developing a method of station keeping without using maneuvering fuel. The experiment complete, the crew released the tether and proceeded with other phases of the mission. Later, with a large amount of fuel conserved, the crew conducted a second unprogrammed rendezvous with the Agena. After a final separation from the Agena, the crew prepared for retrofire and re-entry, controlled completely automatically for the first time. Gemini 11 splashed down approximately two miles from the planned impact point, having accomplished even more than originally planned. There were also two Apollo Saturn 1 flights, both unmanned. The primary objectives for the first of these flights was to study the behavior of the second stage propellant in the weightlessness of Earth orbit, to prove out systems for controlling the propellant behavior, and to verify procedures for restarting the second stage engine. The vehicle was equipped with a nose cone to contain instrumentation and to provide aerodynamic stability. the mission, launched from the John F. Kennedy Space Center, the vehicle's unexpended fuel, the second stage, the instrument unit, and nose cone, the heaviest American payload to date, were launched into low Earth orbit. The fuel, a total of nearly 10 tons, was studied by television and telemetry. During tests in four revolutions, events were monitored almost continuously by a worldwide network of tracking stations. It was proven that the continuous hydrogen venting system could provide enough forward thrust to control the dynamics of the propellant. In the performance of engine restart sequences, which stopped just short of actual ignition, the stage repressurization system and other associated equipment functioned properly. In periods when the venting system was closed, much data was gained on the behavior of liquid propellants in a true weightless state. Overall, the flight had particular significance for the Apollo lunar mission, as well as other future missions, in which liquid fuel stages will have to be placed in parking orbits and restarted under weightless conditions. The second Apollo Saturn I launch of the report period was to be one of the final steps in qualifying the vehicle for manned missions. Primary objectives for the flight, a suborbital mission, were to demonstrate the structural integrity and compatibility of the spacecraft and launch vehicle, to prove the operational capability of onboard systems, to further evaluate the structural integrity and ablative characteristics of the command module heat shield, and to demonstrate the performance of ground personnel and support facilities. The first stage separation, and a few moments later the launch escape system separation, 
were photographed from a distance of more than 40 miles. The separation and second stage ignition were also recorded by a camera on board the first stage. In all, the launch vehicle performed highly successfully, also proving out its new emergency detection system. Generally, the spacecraft also performed according to design. Its guidance and navigation system kept the vehicle on the prescribed course, and the propulsion system successfully executed four burns. The command module re-entered over the Pacific at approximately 28,000 feet per second, a speed approaching re-entry velocities from the upcoming lunar mission. The re-entry and ionized wake of air surrounding the command module were photographed by an onboard camera. The re-entry conditions were successfully withstood by the heat shield. The spacecraft attitude indicator, reflecting one of the re-entry maneuvers, was also photographed by an onboard camera. Finally, the Earth landing sequence, including the deployment of drogue parachutes, and shortly thereafter, the main parachutes, were recorded by an onboard camera, marking the conclusion of a thoroughly successful mission. Following analysis of flight and ground test data, it was decided that the next Apollo Saturn I was to become the first manned mission in the program. The primary objective will be to prove space vehicle systems and operating procedures in manned flight. At the end of September, the launch vehicle had been erected on the launch pad and was undergoing pre-flight checkout. The spacecraft was undergoing checkout at the Kennedy Space Center's industrial area. The flight crew, including Virgil Grissom, Edward White, and Roger Chaffee, was in final training. For future Apollo Saturn I missions, the first flight lunar module entered checkout and final assembly at Grumman Aircraft, and acceptance firings began for the vehicle's descent stage engine at San Juan Capistrano. Fabrication and assembly work continued for the final Apollo Saturn I presently under contract. Both the Chrysler Corporation and Douglas Aircraft, for example, were proceeding with manufacture of assemblies for the launch vehicle stages. Events also continued to build toward flight operations in Apollo Saturn V. At the John F. Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 39, tests of Pad A continued, using the Apollo Saturn V facilities checkout vehicle. Conducted were automatic and manual tests of all pad and launch vehicle liquid fueling systems and checkouts of ground support equipment and instrumentation systems. From the launch control center firing room number one, the tests at pad A were monitored electronically from recently activated consoles. In other milestones, the 402-foot-high mobile service structure was moved for the first time, ultimately being transported to Pad A for interface tests. The structure contains five platforms to provide working access to various levels of the Apollo Saturn V space vehicles. And Transporter 2, completed in September, was used to move Mobile Launcher 2 to the top of Pad A, then to the Vehicle Assembly Building. Meanwhile, major pieces of hardware for the first Apollo Saturn V flight vehicle began to arrive at Launch Complex 39. The first stage was delivered by barge to the launch site and transported to the vehicle assembly building for pre-flight checkout. The third stage, and later the instrument unit, were delivered by the Super Guppy aircraft and also transported to the vehicle assembly building for checkout. In the meantime, the second stage for the first flight vehicle was delivered to the NASA Mississippi Test Facility for acceptance firings, which were temporarily delayed for repair of the propellant tanks. Firings were scheduled for completion and the stage for delivery to the Kennedy Space Center 
during the final three-month period of 1966. The spacecraft command and service modules for the first flight vehicle were undergoing final factory checkout at North American Aviation in preparation for delivery to the Kennedy Space Center. The first Apollo Saturn V flight is scheduled for early 1967. Other major work also progressed in preparation for Apollo Saturn V flights. For the Saturn V second stage, which has experienced significant problems during development, static firing was renewed with an early ground test vehicle at Santa Susana, California. This followed the loss of the all systems ground test vehicle and was necessary to enhance confidence in the second stage performance. For the Saturn V third stage, a series of environmental test firings began at the Air Force's Arnold Engineering Development Center. The objective of the tests, conducted in a chamber which can simulate the environment at 25 miles altitude, is to further prove the stage engine's ability to function in space. For the spacecraft lunar module, qualification and development testing continued to intensify. For facilities, the first manned tests in the manned spacecraft center's new centrifuge were conducted. The centrifuge is used both for training flight crew members and testing spacecraft equipment. The Apollo spacecraft simulator at the Kennedy Space Center approached activation. All 12 of the program's automatic checkout equipment stations were in operation. These will be used in pre-flight checkout of Apollo Saturn space vehicles. A substantial number of the computer programming tapes used in the control of all phases of flight had been completed. The lunar module guidance and navigation simulator at the manned spacecraft center was being used in engineering studies of lunar module flight operations. The simulator provides a specially computed television display for use in evaluating flight procedures over the moon's surface. To meet increasing logistics requirements for Apollo missions, NASA, the Department of Defense, and Industry conducted the first annual management symposium to review the current logistics effort in manned space flight. Finally, in space sciences, the unmanned Lunar Orbiter 1 spacecraft returned significant new data about potential Apollo lunar landing sites. Based on preliminary evaluations, the Lunar Orbiter data seem to support conclusions drawn from other missions that the lunar surface is acceptable for manned Apollo landings. July, August, and September 1966 a period which took man farther from Earth than he had ever before ventured, also brought the United States closer than ever to operational manned spaceflight. In the following months, as the Gemini program is concluded and manned Apollo flights are begun, the nation will continue its progress in space. <laughs>